Ladies and gentlemen, the Military Committee Chiefs of Defence session has just drawn to a close. We will start off this press conference with an opening statement by the uh, Chair of the Military Committee, Admiral Bauer, followed by the Supreme Allied Commander, General Cavoli, and then the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander, Transformation, General Badia. Admiral Bauer, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The NATO Military Committee has just concluded its two-day meeting. The NATO Chiefs of Defence, together with Invitee Sweden, discussed the defence plans that were agreed at the Vilnius Summit. These plans contain force structure requirements, which set the number and types of equipment and organisations that we require across all regions and all domains. This feeds directly into the NATO defence planning process and will shape our armed forces for decades to come. Never before have NATO and national defence plans been so closely interlinked. Allies are now actively working to maximise the executability of these new defence plans. That means, should it come to it, we want to be able to execute these plans with a minimum amount of risk. This is about preparedness. NATO is stronger and readier than it has ever been. Together, we have made immense strides in our collective defence. But we want and need to do more in order to deter and defend any potential threat. In a few minutes, both the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, General Chris Cavoli, and the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, General Chris Badia, will talk about how we do that now and in the future. As I said yesterday, this requires a whole-of-society approach. We need more societal resilience, more energy independence, resilient infrastructure. And across the board, but especially for a key topic such as integrated air and missile defense, we need a fundamentally new approach to public-private cooperation in the defense industry. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday we were briefed by the Ukrainian military representative to NATO, Major General Salkutsan, on behalf of Ukrainian Chief of Defense General Zalushny. Our assessment is there is intense fighting going on, and while Russia's most recent attacks are devastating, they are not militarily effective. At the same time, we see substantial military successes on the Ukrainian side. While the world may have been overly optimistic in 2023, it is important that in 2024 we don't become overly pessimistic. Today is the 694th day of what Russia thought would be a three-day war. Ukraine has prevailed as a sovereign, independent nation in Europe. They are closer to the Euro-Atlantic family than ever. And they have inflicted heavy losses on Russia. For example, more than 300,000 Russian casualties killed and wounded. For example, thousands of Russian tanks and armored vehicles and hundreds of planes have been destroyed. The Ukrainians have been able to liberate significant parts of their territory, pushing back the Russians from roughly 50% of what they occupied at the beginning of the war. Another gain is that the Ukrainians have been able to conduct deep strikes, destroying key Russian capabilities. The fact that Ukraine has been able, without a real navy, to push back the Russian Black Sea Fleet and open up a grain corridor is another huge gain. All military leaders around the table affirmed their strong commitment to helping our Ukrainian brothers and sisters defend themselves. This is not charity. Support to Ukraine is a direct investment in our own security. The only way to get a lasting negotiated solution is to strengthen the Ukrainian position on the battlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is seeing a record amount of violence and conflict. In the run-up to the NATO summit in Washington next year, NATO is actively looking for ways to strengthen and deepen its partnership in our southern neighborhood. That is why today 
the NATO Chiefs of Defense conducted a meeting with their counterparts from the Partner Interoperability Advocacy Group, being Australia, Austria, Ireland, New Zealand, and Switzerland, and a dedicated session with NATO's Indo-Pacific partners, being Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea. We talked about how we can create more and better military cooperation. When it comes to security, there is no such thing as local. All security is connected. And that made it all the more valuable to talk to our partners face-to-face -face on developments that concern us all. We have years, sometimes decades, of cooperation to build on, ranging from information exchange, military education, and training to operating side-by-side -side in NATO missions and operations. Meeting with our partners reminds us that none of us stand alone in the face of challenges or threats. As long as you have partners, you have better solutions. And with that, I would like to give the floor to the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, General Cavoli. The floor is yours. Thanks, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and Happy New Year to you all. Very uh, pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you for a moment this afternoon. Um, as you know, last summer, Allied heads of state and government approved our regional plans, and they gave us the green light to continue with all aspects of modernizing our collective defense system. So for the first time in 30 years, we have the strategy, deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area, and we have the plans to make the alliance fit for the purpose of collective territorial defense. So now we're in the process of making our plans executable. This means making sure we have the force commitments, the command and control arrangements, and the enablement of our plan that our plans require. Of course, we also need to rehearse and refine our plans through rigorous training and exercises. And on that note, uh, we today announced the kickoff of Exercise Steadfast Defender 2024, which commences next week and runs through May. Steadfast Defender 24 will be the largest NATO exercise in decades, with participation from approximately 90,000 forces from all 31 allies, plus our good partner, Sweden. The alliance will demonstrate its ability to reinforce the Euro-Atlantic area via transatlantic movement of forces from North America. This reinforcement will occur during a simulated emerging conflict scenario against a near-peer adversary. Steadfast Defender 24 will be a clear demonstration of our unity, our strength, and our determination to protect each other, to protect, of course, our values and the rules-based international order. Um, finally, and on a related but separate note, uh, a word about the Allied Reaction Force. The ARF is a critical component of our new force structure, of our new force model, and it supports our plans. The ARF is capable of carrying out a full spectrum of missions, and it serves as a rapid, deployable strategic reserve for SACIR. In the fall of last year, NATO Rapid Deployment Corps Italy was selected as the interim headquarters for this ARF. They are currently training, exercising, and rehearsing in preparation for their new role. They are on track to receive validation as the interim ARF headquarters following exercise Steadfast Defender as soon as May. And thank you again. I look forward to your questions and your comments. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Complementing and underlining what has been said by Admiral Bauer and General Cavoli, I would like to expand in this context from an Allied Command transformation view and our role we play in all of this. And uh, let me start by saying, and what you have heard, as important uh, as it is being prepared for today and tonight in order to cope with all possible challenges this alliance faces or might face, as important is the tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, and this is where my command very much focuses in behalf of all of NATO. We, as an alliance, with all its nations, need to ensure to be more agile and be more flexible, and we do this via our agreed transformational path. As the warfighting of tomorrow becomes more complex and multi-domain, 
We need to ensure that we are in every aspect faster and better than our competitors. This goes with nation's transformation, and this is a perpetual journey, and it's not a, a one-time event. Our warfighting transformation pushes boundary, forging a collective edge in order to become better every day. We do this through integrated multi-domain operations, which means seamless warfare across land, sea and air. Those are the classic domains, but the two new domains are cyber and space. And I get to that in a second, but now we're working within five domains and we have to completely understand what that means. And this is what transformation is very much about it. At the same time, of course, with that, we have to look at flexible command structures for rapid adaptation to ever-changing threats, and a wavering interoperability, united actions despite the diversive systems we have, and this is from the first minute on we are needed, and continuous capability advancement in order to stay ahead of the curve. With that, we shaping a strong and more agile military within the 31 nations. The world demands a greater agility and flexibility, and the two past days, discussions focused exactly on achieving just that. Informed by the latest strategic concept, we are now in, if you will, the defense planning mode, how we go forward about all those things. We are identifying the capabilities we need individually and collectively with speed and with strength. And capability is the foundation because without capabilities, we cannot, pass it, we cannot put anything against it. The main part about it is how we change into all this, and as we call it, a multi-domain uh, uh, enabled alliance in order to fulfill multi-domain operations. And this is within the new understanding because as much as is uh, with the military at the same side, we look what the civil domains hold and how we can be more or there can be more synergies in order to become more or better and stronger. So multi-domain is not just about operations in multi-domains, it's true multi-domain operations overall. How do we do that? Number one is we look very much at interaction. So increased cooperation with non-military actors. And I just give you one example here. If you look at space, for instance, space has a lot of civil infrastructure and there is no need to dupl duplicate everything in order to use space to a better extent. And this is where transformation also goes. How do we incorporate with the civil world and find all those synergies? Just as an example. Connectivity, synchronizing military and non-military effects, as I already alluded to, for converging effects. And last but not least, all the integration, fully embracing cyber and space as explained as operational demands. The precondition to transform into a multi-domain enabled alliance is digital transformation. And this goes without saying in order and this will, is happening in parallel. So if you will, in short, we are transforming from a platform centric force into a data centric force. Our strengths will remain unity in interoperability with all of that. The alliance is always greater than the sum of its parts, and MDO within that embodies this principle, leveraging our collective strengths in interoperability. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, transformation is not a luxury for NATO, it's a necessity, and we are very well prepared for that. And one last remark for you. Everything we do is also based on a strategic foresight and strategic foresight analysis, which means the outlook, what will change. And we just uh, uh, did put it on our website, ACT website, as of today. There's the new strategic foresight analysis being released today. So whenever you have interest in seeing what NATO thinks about, what the future challenges might be, you will find some uh, interesting information there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. With that, we will be taking your questions and we will start off with Reuters. Andrew Gray from Reuters, a, a question for all three of you. Um, how do you currently assess the state of the threat that Russia poses to NATO as an alliance? How much has it been degraded by the war, of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and how much is it able to rebuild that uh, capacity even as the war continues? Thank you. 
Um, in terms of, uh, you have to look at it in two ways. There's, there's the different areas, of course, the, the different domains. I would say in the land domain, I, I would consider there's the biggest uh, uh, change over the last two, uh, two years. In the land domain, uh, you see not necessarily a quantitative change. Actually, the number of forces that have been going into Ukraine have increased over the last two and a half years. But qualitatively, it is going down in terms of the land domain. And that is both in their capabilities and in the personnel. Capabilities, because they lost a lot of m um, more modern capabilities in, in the war uh, with Ukraine. And in terms of personnel, uh, it is more people, but it is, it's less trained uh, people than, than when they started the, the war. That's in the land domain. And they lost a lot of uh, uh, tanks, uh, a lot of armored vehicles, they lost airplanes, they lost helicopters. So they, they lost a lot of equipment. They're now, some of the, uh, they are rebuilding, but most of the time it's older types they're rebuilding, or they're taking types out of uh, capabilities or equipment out of stock, which is most of the time also uh, older uh, equipment. So that is, that is in the land domain. In terms of the missile uh, capability, uh, over time, they have used, of course, a lot. They are producing again, uh, and that has increased. The production on, uh, on their missiles has increased over time, uh, the last uh, two years. And unfortunately, they are now also getting, of course, missiles from, from uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, we expect them to get missiles from Iran, although we haven't seen them yet. Uh, and, of course, they have received the drones from Iran uh, and the drone technology and that, are, that, they, uh, that they use to build the, 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 the Iranian drones in Russia. In terms of their air force, I think they have lost uh, a considerable number of aircraft, but still what, it, what remains is, is still a considerable force in fighter aircraft and helicopters. Uh, and, of course, uh, um, reconnaissance planes and, 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 and the works that makes up their Air Force. So I think uh, their Air Force is not untouched, but it is still very capable. And the same applies to their Navy and space and cyber, cyber capabilities. But So the, it is a diverse picture, and they are uh, 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 most obviously are going to reconstitute, uh, but it is hampered by uh, the sanctions, it is hampered by money uh, issues, and it is hampered by their ability to produce enough, especially the more modern equipment. But they are doing uh, actually rather well in terms of their artillery production and uh, their older tanks. So I think that is, of course, concern, because uh, in the end, sometimes quantity becomes a quality in itself. Maybe, Chris, if you want to add. Uh, no. That, uh what Rob explained is, is exactly what I would have said. I would just add, in terms of their reconstitution, that they are sparing no effort uh, in their reconstitution. They are devoting an enormous uh, fraction of their budget to the military over the coming years, uh, next year specifically, and they are running their defense industrial base just as fast as they can right now. Those are important things to consider. Um, as, we, uh, as, as we study this question very closely. And in terms of workforce, they use uh, people from prisons. They use, uh, there is uh, indications that they might even use uh, uh, people from other nations. So um, that is, of course, uh, that it means it is a problem for them, and, but they are trying to find ways to solve that as well. I would just add one thing from uh, our perspective. The way we go is never underestimate and this is how we prepare, and this is how we plan when it comes to capability, capability development and how we go into the future. Next question, uh, here at the front. Ukraine. Yep. Uh, Vitaly Sizou, UATV, Ukraine. Uh, uh, my question to follow up. The previous one, uh, the German defense minister believes that uh, we must be prepared for the fact that Russia may attack some NATO countries over the next few years. How do you consider this threat, and are you ready for such direct or hybrid threats? It's actually not new, because uh, in our plans, we describe, in our strategy and our plans, we describe two threats, which is Russia and the terrorist groups. 
So we look at Russia as a threat for NATO, and therefore the plans that we have developed and that have been approved in Vilnius are to counter the threat amongst that is Russia. So the fact that we have to be ready for an attack from Russia is not news in itself, because that is what our plans are for. We are a defensive alliance, and we should be ready, and we are ready, and, but we are improving to, to be readier with more people, with better capabilities in certain areas, uh, in terms of being ready for that possibility. Your question is my job. Yes, we're ready. AFP, and then uh, at the back. Thanks a lot. Uh, I guess for Admiral Bauer, for General Cavoli. Um, uh, on Ukraine specifically, you said that we shouldn't uh, be overly pessimistic about this year. Do you think Ukraine is in a position to launch another major offensive this year? Or is this year more about reconstitution and rearmament for Ukraine and harassing Russia with long-range fire? And on the other flip side, follow on to my question, uh, the question from Reuters, is Russia capable of reconquering or conquering considerable territory in Ukraine this year? Thank you. Um, you know, war is a difficult thing. It's not, it's, not, it's not always a planable thing in the sense that you will always know and, and be able to predict what is going to happen. Because it involves two nations, in this case, where uh, both nations make plans the Russians have basically not achieved any of their strategic objectives. That is important to say as well in terms of being uh, pessimistic on the Russian side. They have not achieved any of their strategic objectives. So they will most likely continue the fight, but they have some difficulties in finding uh, uh, the right uh, amounts of people and, and quality and, and ammunition as well. They have not been overly... Um, successful when it comes to their offensives against uh, Ukraine in the last couple of months. So there is back and forth at the front, but it's not that there is a, a big push and a successful push from the Russians. So both sides are now in a, in a phase where uh, it, it is not moving a lot forward one, one way or the other. And that is, that is what we see. Um, of course, uh, there, both sides will continue to make sure that they are, ha are having the upper hand, so to say, in terms of the initiative and the opportunities that they see, and then, and then seize them if, 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 if it is possible. But it requires personnel, it requires uh, the cap right capabilities, ammunition, and, and the personnel is not only the people but also the right training. So all that is being done and, and is being worked on uh, with uh, with the with all the nations that work with the Ukraine uh, with Ukraine in in in, in these efforts as, as it has been in the last two years, um, so I, I don't think we should sort of expect a miracle happening on either side, but of course both nations will always look for opportunities, uh, and it will not be easy. And it and, and I don't expect any as I said miracles. Uh, so it is, it is going to be difficult. We need to continue to support Ukraine. I think that is the most important thing that all of us need to realize, because still, if the Russians leave Ukraine today, the war is over. If Ukraine stops the war today, they lost their country. So there is for them no alternative. They have to continue the fight. And uh, in order to find just a just peace, the Ukrainians want, of course, the most uh, uh, preferable p uh, position if at any stage a negotiation starts. Chris. You know, with regard to who's going to do what in the coming months, um, obviously it's dangerous business to make public predictions about an adversary's actions. Um, and, uh, and, and with regard to... Ukraine's actions, it's, it's very rarely the case that an, a military is either preparing or operating. Those two things usually happen in parallel. Um, and I think we can expect to see that over the coming year. Um, Ukraine both generating force and, and employing the force. With regard to, you know, what they do with the force, well, you know, all militaries either seize 
opportunities or create opportunities. And, um, and, and of course, it would not be very wise to talk about what, what those opportunities might be. Uh, next question in the back. Uh, yes, Victor Nummelin, Swedish news agency. Uh, in, in Sweden, there's been a big discussion about the government and uh, the chief of defense uh, uh, warning the people that uh, Sweden needs to be prepared for a situation like in Ukraine. Uh, was this something that you discussed, or the state of preparedness, or um, what's your view on that? And at the same time, uh, for the military planning, how frustrating is it to do the planning for the northern part with one country still not allowed in? Thank you. Well, we plan for the alliance, and uh, we prepare for new members, and that's the difference, I think. Uh, so we plan on, uh, on the 31 members. That's, the, that's what the plans are, uh, are based on, including uh, Finland. Uh, and, of course, everything is in place militarily at the moment. To uh, Once uh, the political agreement is there and Sweden can join or will join, then I think the military integration will be extremely fast, given the preparations on the Swedish side and the discussions between Sweden and NATO so far. So I think there is no issue there. They will uh, get uh, sort of fall into the fold very, very quickly in terms of the plans, uh, but they are not part of the plans at the moment because they're not a member. Uh, with regard to the, to the remarks of um, uh, General Biden, I think he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's very right. Um, uh, and, 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 and I said similar things, uh, meaning that we need to understand as a society that war and fighting is not only something of the military. I think a nation needs to understand that when it comes to a war, as we see in Ukraine, it is a whole of society event. And for many, many decades, we had this idea that we had the professional military and they would solve these security issues that we had in Afghanistan, in Iraq. But if you talk collective defense, it is a whole of society event. It will not be enough to have the present military. You will need more people from society to sustain the military in terms of people. You need the industry to have enough ammunition to, to produce new tanks, new ships, new aircraft, new artillery pieces. All that is part of this discussion of a whole of society uh, uh, event. And I think more people need to understand it's not just something of the armed forces and money. We need to be readier in, in, in across the whole spectrum. It's money, it's the military, it is being uh, ready to have, you have to have a system in place to find more people if it comes to a war, whether we like it or not. And then you talk mobilization, reservists, uh, conscription. I'm, I'm not saying it has to be one or the other system, but you have to think about this. You need to be able to fall back on an industrial base that is able to produce weapons and ammunition fast enough to be, able to, to, to be able to continue a conflict if you are in it. We're not seeking war as NATO, but we have to be ready for war. That is our job. Chris. Um, we don't get frustrated in the military. We just do. <laughs> um, we, as Rob said, are preparing for uh, Sweden's entry. Um, of course, not being a member, they're, they're not in the plans right now. Um, but geographically, they're right in the middle of part of the plans. So, of course, it's something that has to be prepared for in general. Um, we have also benefited greatly in this preparation from our history, operational and training with Sweden. Um, we've had a partnership for many years, and our information exchanges um, at the appropriate level are extremely robust. So I, I have no concern whatsoever about how quickly we're going to be able to incorporate uh, Finland fully into the alliance when, um, when, when admitted. Uh, it will go very quickly and very smoothly. Thanks. 
to add on that from a transformational aspect and when it comes to all the defense planning aspects, we are fully prepared because beforehand, before inauguration, you can do all those things, especially when we look at harmonization, standardization, interoperability aspects. All those things have been discussed. Uh, it's outlined what it means and uh, Sweden, I can tell you, would be fully prepared to uh, join whenever it is the time to join. Okay, then we have time for one final question, Deutsche Welle. Thanks, sorry, Terry Schultz. Um, a bit of a follow-up on that, incorporating remarks that you made, um, uh, Admiral Bauer, uh, yesterday. Um, what's happening in Sweden is that people are going out and panic buying um, radios that don't need uh, electricity. They're buying tents. Um, people are signing up it, just in the last 10 days since we, uh, uh, the comments about prepare for war. They're signing up to the self-defense forces in, in a sense of, of sort of a feeling of insecurity. Do you think that it has reached that level? You said he was right to use these words, but that's how it's making people feel. Do you feel that Sweden is really in such a vulnerable position? And your remarks that NATO needs um, this transformation to... Uh, I'm looking here, what is it? Um, a war fighting transformation. This press conference is a carbon copy of the one, the one we could have had a year ago where you needed to be ready, you needed to transform. Why a year later are you still saying that this transformation is needed and hasn't taken place? And General Kabbalah, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that as well. Sorry, the big difference with a year ago, I would say, Terry, is that there's a lot of things that have happened in the armed forces and in the defense organizations. What hasn't happened is in our societies the understanding that it is more than the military that has to be able to, uh, uh, to, to operate in a conflict or in a war. It is the whole of society that will get involved whether we like it or not. That realization, we didn't talk about that much a year ago. If you look back the last year, what has happened in our alliance with regard to the battle groups that we set up. If you look back to the training, the fact that we now have a steadfast defender with 90,000 troops, that is a record number. That is a record number of troops that we can bring to bear and have an exercise with in that size. Across the alliance, uh, across the ocean, from the US to Europe, in Europe, that is a big change. It's not a, it's not a carbon copy of a year ago. And so in the alliance and in the armed forces, a lot of things have happened. But the discussion is much wider. It is also the industrial base. It is also the people have to understand they play a role. They're part of the solution. Society is part of the solution. Industry, the private sector. Chris Badia talked about, the, uh, in terms of space, uh, the relationship with the, with the uh, civilian companies. That is all part of that thinking. And we need to sit down and make it possible together. It's not just a job of the armed forces. That's, that's my call that I was talking about yesterday. Uh, that is what uh, General Biden in Sweden is, is talking about. And the fact that people find it a surprise and as a result buy a radio on batteries, that is great. <laughs> it is part of, of, of the package that the, the Swedish government is, is talking about. You need to have water, you need to have uh, a, a, a radio on batteries, and you need to have a, a, a flashlight on, on batteries to make sure that you can survive the first 36 hours. Things like that. That's simple things. But it starts there. The, the realization that not everything is planable, not everything is going to be honky-dory in the next 20 years. I'm not saying it is going wrong tomorrow, but we have to realize it's not a given that we are in peace. And that's why we have the plans. That's why we are preparing for a conflict with, uh, uh, with Russia and the terror groups. If it comes to it, if they attack us, we're not seeking any conflict. But if they attack us, we have to be ready. And maybe... Sorry. In addition to that, one year ago, if you just see defense spending throughout all the nations within one year, what the commitment is, how every nation really puts more money into that because they understand what it means for a, from a transformational aspect, how to go forward, how we are tasked to look into new technologies, how we are tasked to cooperate to a much greater extent with the civil side. All those things. So it's not that we are buying more of the same stuff. 
Of course, we always could use more. But now it's really how do we see all those synergies? Because if you see on human resource, there are there are always limits somewhere. So the question is, how do we use what we have and how to develop into the future to a much better extent to stay on the edge? And if you look at that and if you analyze it over the past 12 months, what has happened, what the commitment is from the different nations overall and how closer we got to that, so there's a, a, a great change. You can see that. Yeah, Terry, I'm sorry if, uh, if we gave the impression that, that nothing's going on. Um, <laughs> so, um, just a few examples inside Allied Command Operations, which, which is what I command. Um, we, we have completely reorganized my headquarters at SHAPE. Um, it is now organized in a warfighting fashion. It operates on an operational battle rhythm and sequence of events. And we've rehearsed that during a very intensive exercise early this year called Steadfast Jupiter, um, which incorporated not only my headquarters, but all of our subordinate headquarters, and very importantly, a number of national headquarters. Um, because, of course, any plans we execute will have to interoperate with the nations where, where the operations would occur. Uh, this hasn't been done in a very, very long time. It's uh, very intensive to do that, and it requires a lot of adjustment. Uh, but it was necessary. It was necessary for us to be able to execute the plans, and I'm very uh, content with, with where it's going. We have completely reformed the way we do force sourcing, that is matching nation's forces against the plans. Um, the method we were using previously uh, could not be adapted appropriately to the new set of plans because of volume and the, the size of the requirement. Um, the way we've done it has made a multiples more forces in all domains available to the Alliance and, and readily available to be turned over to my command. Um, we have refined the plans at the tactical level, and that is an ongoing process. So when we, we, we do the planning, we start at the strategic level, then go to the operational level and do the big muscle movements. But a lot of refinement has to be done at the tactical level. So all of our cores, nations where the cores operate, our joint force commands um, and our uh, component commands under such as LANDCOM and AIRCOM are all working very hard to do um, refinement of the plans, which of course further informs our, our future efforts. And we're rehearsing those in tabletop exercises to, to find um, exactly the best way to refine them. Um, we are on the verge of announcing um, changes in our C2, in our command and control arrangements, that will put specific headquarters against specific parts of the plans for the first time in, in a long time. This will allow us to become very specifically oriented on areas and tasks that are necessary in the plans. Um, we are uh, coming very close to finishing approval of, of a new alert system, an alert system that will grant the appropriate authorities at the appropriate times on the road to a crisis so that we'll be able to move quickly and we'll be able to cover time, uh, cover distances in a relevant amount of time, which is a very important part of positioning a force for deterrence. Um, these are all huge, huge advances. And then, of course, we've been conducting uh, operations throughout the year under the authorities um, granted with the activation of our previous set of plans and under the principles of uh, DDA, De Deterrence and Defense of the Euro-Atlantic Area, our strategy. Um, we have been able to put together defensive operations when necessary. We did one um, to defend the summit in Vilnius. We did one um, in Poland over the uh, over the past autumn at a sensitive time to make sure Poland's airspace was secure. And we're in the process of doing one called Southern Shield in Romania right now. All of these have been made possible by the uh, by the transformation of the alliance to be able to move that quickly. Thank you all very much. That's all we have time for for this session. Uh, I want to remind everybody that the strategic foresight analysis, as mentioned by General Badia, is on the ACT website. And at the top of the stairs, we have a fact sheet about Steadfast Defender with a lot more facts and figures waiting for you. Thank you all so much for attending. Until next time. <laughs>